This week on Fireside Chat, we focus on the trade deadline. We'll talk about the deals that the Flames did make, and the deals that they didn't make. We'll talk about Camilleri staying here, and if we think he'll be here for the long term. We look at some of the young players the Flames have brought up to fill roster spots, and we even have an interview with former Flame, Kale Hulse. Stay tuned. This is Fireside Chat, episode 39, Trade Deadline. Recorded March 6th, 2014. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Welcome back for another episode of Fireside Chat, and it's been a long break. Matt, we've been off since before the Olympics. It's great to be back talking hockey. How you doing? Very good. Glad the Olympics are over so we can actually talk Flames hockey again. Yeah, glad the Olympics are over. Glad the men won uh, Canadian gold, the women won Canadian gold. We couldn't have asked for a better story than that at the Olympics. No. And we decided to wait until after the trade deadline to do this episode because really there wasn't much going on in the in the Flames world before the deadline. It was really just coming back and playing a couple games, and I think as as fans, we're all in a holding pattern. You can't, you know, like I don't personally like speculating on ifs and maybes. I'd rather react to things that have happened. So, you know, doing the show the day after the deadline makes a little bit more sense. Well, let's talk about some pre-deadline news. Um, one story that broke just for the Olympics was that the Flames talked about or uh, talked about it and then ended up doing it, and Chris Russell was signed for a two, two-year deal, $2.6 million average per year. That was rumored for a while, and it got done just for the Olympics. What do you think about them re-signing Russell? Uh, it's a very good bridge contract for him. He's been inconsistent defensively thus far this season you know you know but anytime you can get a defenseman that's got 20 points just past the halfway point in the season signed for 2.6 million that's you know that's very cheap so there's nothing to complain about like, he, you know, you look at Weidman, he has the same amount of points as Weidman, and he's getting paid half the amount, so. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, he's, uh, Russell's 26, we acquired him in the offseason for a mid-round pick, I think that for where this team is at, and, you know, where they're going to be next year, I think we had to give him that kind of money, but I definitely think it's a, it's a good contract, and it gives us two years to figure out where he's going to be at in his career. And at 28, if he hasn't progressed the way we want, I'm sure there would still be some value in him if we want to get rid of him. And if he does progress, we'll sign him longer. Yeah. You know, plus with him, like, kind of breaking out this year, you don't know if it's, like, how Derek Smith played really awesome for, like, half a year a couple of years ago and then has disappeared since. But, you know, at $2.6 million, like, that's you know, not expensive enough where it hampers you in any way, especially where we're at right now. So, you know, if he stays as good or improves, that's all good. If not, you know, he's doing a good job as is, so that's fine. And he's at uh, 21 points this year. His all-time high for points was when he was with Columbus. He got 23 in one season, so he's just about there. So, yeah, it seems like he's on track to have a record year, and I think that's a, a good contract for him. Yeah, and at least, like, next year he can try and push himself to be even better, which I do think he has that in him. It's just, it, like all young players, you have to wait and see because uh, you just don't know if they're going to progress or not. So it's encouraging thus far, though. It sure is. And, you know, I know that he hasn't been the most consistent guy on our blue line this year, but I like Russell. I mean, he's – I think he's made a mark for himself really well. When we, when you look at what we gave away for, our, for him and what he was on other teams he played for, I feel like he's come in here and he's really fought for his spot and really, you know, has played a – 
a good season so far for a young player like him and considering who this team is. So, yeah, I definitely think that he's, he deserves to be back for a couple of years. Yep. The other story before the Olympics that was really an odd one was that Lane McDermott, the player the Flames traded for earlier this year, I'm trying to even remember what they gave up for him. A uh, six-round pick. And he's now decided that he's lost his passion and he retired from professional hockey. He played, what, one game here, two games here on the big club? He ran Jaguar in that one game, and I think he went to the minors right after that. Now, do you think this is a case of him decided that he doesn't like the way the Flames are treating him, so he wants out? Or do you think he's realized he's probably a tough guy in his career and maybe making a living, getting punched in the head for you know another six, seven years probably isn't the best career move? Well... You know, me personally, like, getting paid 67000 or whatever the AHL players make and being a punching bag, like, that wouldn't be worth it to me. So, I, like, I can understand, like, especially with the concussion concerns and all that, like, you know, if you're getting an NHL paycheck, then, you, you know, you're kind of mitigating your risk there. But, you know... It, it's just a very difficult situation and like I can understand why he walked away you know like it pretty much like there's a lot of professions out there where you can make close to $67,000 a year and you don't have to be punched in the head on a regular basis so you know gotta weigh that in there yeah and, and you know it's what you're saying about him um you know making it to the nhl and then it'd be fine i really don't think that he would be anyone's number one choice on say the ufa market or even by trade for a tough guy there's a lot of other tough guys out there who he would have to kind of one up in order to get anyone to ever pay attention to him and pay more than like a sixth round pick and put him in the nhl for a long time so i think it's probably an uphill battle either way yeah, and, you know, best of luck to him and his future endeavors, and, you know, I hope he's successful with what he does. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And as a Flames fan, I look at it and say, you know what, I'm willing to let him walk because we really didn't pay a lot for him. Oh, yeah. Well, it's one of those things where, like, really a six-round pick, we traded Tim Jackman, you, you know, for one just like a, the day prior i think so yeah it pretty much came out to be jackman for mcdermott when everything was said and done because we traded jackman for a six and then flipped a six for mcdermott yeah so big deal you know like it was if we would have waived jackman per se then that's the same thing so who cares <laughs> and you know good for him for identifying that early and I guess getting out, I don't want to have a guy here in a rebuild when we're looking for talented young guys who doesn't want to be here and who might bring down his line mates and that sort of thing. So good for him for identifying that and getting out now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have absolutely no problem with that. But, you know, it's weird. The Flames seem to have had an issue over the years, more so than I can remember with other teams, of young players who don't have the desire to play anymore or, or who just leave the game for whatever reason. Who was it early in the year? Ryan House that did the same thing? Yeah. Well, actually, I kind of view that in a good way because the Flames, uh, as we've seen with the young guys getting called up, they are likely drilled into them when they get to Abbotsford on like all the preparation and the hard work and all that that goes into being an NHL player and some people just can't take that kind of barrage so you know we're getting the you know it's a survival of the fittest so to speak so yeah no you're right and and maybe you are right that I, Calgary probably has an organization that's open to this that you know says hey if you don't want to be here don't be here and from what I've heard about the AHL system, it sounds like Troy Ward really wants the boys to be focused on this. As we've seen with, uh, like, Grandland coming up, like, he looks like a 10-year veteran, and, you know, he's just making his NHL debut. 
and you have to attribute that to partially to that kind of system in Abbotsford where they're just, you know, give your best all the time. From what I understand, the system in Abbotsford is Troy Ward spends a lot of time with these guys even off the ice. I remember hearing a story. I, forget, I think it was Feaster who told it at one of the season ticket holder dinners or something. But he said when new guys come to Abbotsford, Troy Ward actually takes them to the grocery store and shows them exactly what to buy and what aisles to avoid and that sort of thing. So he's really trying to teach these guys not just how to play hockey, but how to make a living as a professional athlete. And that's why I really like what the job that he's been doing down yeah, there. Yeah, me too. Pretty much the perfect coach for that kind of thing. That was the big reason I didn't want him to get promoted when we were looking for a head coach in the offseason, and it was rumored that he was in contention for Hartley's job because I want him to stay in the AHL for right now. I think that's where we need him the most. Oh, yeah, and you know in a few years he'll be an NHL coach, but, you know, for now, you know, I'm glad that he's there and he's doing a very fantastic job down there, so I'm... There's absolutely nothing I can complain about. No, down there. and you know I think the fact that the Heat are in contention for a Calder Cup run this year is a testament to how well he's doing. Yeah, although not recently, considering we called up pretty much their entire team. True, <laughs> true, but you know it, that's a business move, right? So. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Well. So, so, it's nice seeing Abbotsford beat Ottawa yesterday. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and we've seen that in the past, too, where the Flames will call up a whole bunch of guys at the end of the year and, um, you know, end up going on a bit of a tear with those guys. Can't now, hurt. all the guys they called up, and we'll talk more about them later on, but all the guys they called up, was that before the deadline, or do those count as their four sign-ups, or their four call-ups? Three of the four did. Uh, they called up Reinhardt, Knight, and McDonald before the deadline, and they had to do, like, a paper send-down. And, like, they sent uh, Grandland and Ordeo down on paper. And then recalled them on paper. And Hanowski, after the trade deadline, because that's when Snapnack was traded, he was recalled, and he counts as one okay. of the four. I remember, I remember they did a paper um, send-down like that. I think it was with... Chris Kalanos or something a couple years ago when he was here. And I remember he actually had to, by league rules, go to Abbotsford, check in, and then come back. And I remember reading in the paper that he actually flew to Abbotsford, went to the arena, said to the coach, I'm here, and then got back on a plane and flew to Calgary. Yeah. Well, on the actual trade deadline day, you can just send them down without having them have oh, to that's report. Good. Because, like, that's ridiculous, especially if they're playing that night. It has to do with the AHL. Uh, to be eligible for the playoff roster, you have to be on that roster before that okay. date. Well, speaking of players moving and trade deadlines, why don't we talk about the trade deadline and the Flames' actions or lack of actions there? Yeah, it was a bit of a weird trade it was. deadline. I mean, us. the big name that we were all expecting to move was Mike Camilleri. And for me, things got interesting, what was it, two, three days before the deadline when it was, no, probably about a week, when it was announced that the Flames offered him a, a new contract. And I really, when I heard that, I thought, well, what are they doing? Like, if you're trying to get rid of this guy, why are you offering him a new contract? And that's immediately when doubt started to set in for me of, well, if they're offering him a new contract, what is the probability this guy's going to end up leaving town? Well... I can't really... It's one of those situations where, like, I wish they would have got something for the asset that Camilleri is. But as a person and as a hockey player, Mike Camilleri is pretty much right up there with Mark Giordano for, like, the right attitude and mindset that you want around young players. Because of how hard and much work that Mike Camilleri puts in off the ice. So, you know, like on one hand you want to cash in that asset. But, you know, having him around if the Flames can re-sign him for next year. You know, like that's a beneficial thing. Even though, like on the ice it's not really making any difference. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I think Cammy is one of the veterans who we have here who would be a good 
veteran going forward and a good guy to help lead us through the rebuild. I've, I've been thinking a lot about it since that first contract came out, and I agree with you that I wanted to, if we're not going to move him, I want to get an asset from him. The fact we didn't move him leads me to believe that a signing announcement is imminent. If it ends up going to July 1st and we don't have a deal with him, that's when I'm going to be angry that we had the chance to move him, we didn't, and we got nothing for him. But if he stay, if he stays here, I'm perfectly fine with that. But if we lose him for nothing, I'm going to be really mad at Burke. Yeah, that would be a really big fail <laughs> if he's not here. Because, you know, like, as you saw with uh, Vanek going to Montreal for a subpar return, something is better than nothing. And, you know, if you're not keeping them, then, you know, you just wasted the opportunity to get even a second round pick. Yeah, exactly. So, well, you know, yeah. you know, and even if you look at what our assets went for on deadline day, like... You know, we traded uh, Red O'Bara for a second rounder. We traded Lee Stemniak for a third rounder. Like, there's no reason we could not have got a top 90 pick for Camilleri if we wanted it. Yeah, and that's the semi-disappointing thing. But, you know, if he stays, like, that's A-OK in yeah, my no, book. Yeah, no, I, I totally so. agree with you. If he's going to stay here and he's the kind of veteran that we want, which I think he's proven he is, the kind of veteran who is OK to be here and willing to... Um, work through a rebuild and know what that's going to take of him as a veteran. I definitely think... And Cammy likes Calgary. I mean, he decided to come back here from Montreal. So he he likes the city. I know his wife likes the city. So yeah, if he wants to stay here, I'm totally cool with that. What I'm not cool with is losing yeah. on July 1st. Mm-hmm. And also, realistically, the Flames are going to have the same problem that Edmonton did with attracting free agents. So having, you know, we're going to be like $10 million plus dollars short of the cap floor come July 1st, you know, having Camilleri there, if you re-sign him for a similar-ish amount, even on a one-year deal, that will help us hit the floor, you know, where, you know, you're not likely going to go out and sign whomever the top free agent well, is. Well, I was thinking about that too, and I think that Camilleri is fairly well liked around the league, and if we are trying to attract UFAs here, having Cami on the roster as really the cornerstone guy, as far as veterans go, I think might help us with signing new UFAs. True. Either way, like as long as he's around next year, there's no, no. problem. With how this no, all I totally agree down. with you. I'm fine with him staying. I guess I just wish that they would have announced in the post-deadline press conference, we didn't trade Mike Camilleri, and instead we've signed him to whatever contract. But right now we sit around waiting, saying, they didn't trade him, he's not signed, what's going on? Mm-hmm. For grading the trade deadline, like I have to put it as incomplete because there's just not enough information yet on the details. Yeah. The other thing, too, I had a feeling they may not have traded Cammy because if you listen to Burke talking on, what was it, the day before the deadline, he held a media call, and they talked to TSN during their deadline coverage, and he kept being really coy about, well, there's all these teams ahead of us, and you know all these dominoes have to fall first, and he never really committed to, look, I'm out there trying to make deals. You know, like, I, to me, if you wanted to make a Camilleri deal, you could have. You could have lowered your price and said, hey, come out, grab Camilleri, and, you know, avoid the bidders on the big guys. Like, it just never seemed like he was committed to making a deal that day. And that's fine. You know, like, he did, for the trades he did make, he did get full value or, you know, plus on Barra's case. So, you know... It's it's just, you know, it is what it exactly. is. Exactly. And yeah, if he's here, I'm happy he's here. But there's there's going to be yeah. a lot of angry people in the city if we lose him July 1. Oh yeah, definitely pitchfork time. So let's talk about the other deals that he did make. Um let's talk about the one that we were both surprised about first. Red Obara got dealt to the Colorado Avalanche in exchange for a second round draft pick in this year's draft. I did not expect to see Barra go anywhere. I didn't. I heard no rumors going into it. 
I know his contract's up at the end of this year, but he's a restricted free agent who's only played one year in the NHL, so I'm pretty sure the Flames could have retained his rights. It would surprise me that he moved. Yeah. You never like seeing potential getting dealt, and he does have potential. Like You could see it when he would make those brilliant saves that he would do. It's just that there's also a lot of rough edges there. And having audio, like what we saw last night, you know, you're, it's a little easier to move him because you have somebody that's equally qualified. It's just, you know, I hope he does well, but it would kind of suck I if hope he, he does became well, but not too Colorado's well. Kiprasov. Yeah, I don't want him to be no, Colorado's exactly. Kipper. <laughs> you know. And you know, I think as a goaltender, like if I was if I was in Barra's shoes, and I was told as the reporters told him and as um, Burke told everybody at his press conference, Patrick Waugh specifically asked about this guy. So if you're a goaltender, even though it might be kind of bittersweet to leave Calgary, you've got to be stoked that Patrick Waugh, arguably one of the best goalies of his, of his time, like him or hate him, wants you to be on his team. Yeah. And also Francois Lair, who's like the Canadian goalie guru, he also really liked them as well. So, you know, like I can see it from both sides. You know, we, we're deep in goaltenders at the moment, and we need other things, especially defensive prospects. And there are quite a few in this draft around where the that pick will be. So, you know, it, if we get something like that for Barra, then we're trading from an area of strength to address an area of weakness. So you can't really complain it's too much about that. It's funny for a team that. that is where the Flames are in the standings and are in the first year of a rebuild to say that we have an area of strength. Yeah, well, we actually have a, quite a few areas of strength. Well, and you know, so, after Kipper, after Kipper retired, people said, oh, the Flames have no, you know, goaltenders in the system. I mean, that was the thing for a while. And so, yeah, it's good to see that all of our goaltenders have come along quite well. If you, if you look this year, I remember when Barra first got called up and McDonald was sent down to the AHL. Barra was kind of the golden boy. All the fans loved him. He was playing well. We know that the coach really thought a lot of him. And it was funny because Ramo kind of got pushed into the backup role, and now it's been reversed, and Ramo's really come back around as a starter, and Barra wasn't playing a lot. So Barra is 27. I, you know, I have to remind myself that sometimes. He's not like he's 18 or 19. This is a guy who is 27, who's probably going to be peaking very soon. So maybe what we see is what we get out of him. Yeah. Well, he's a year younger than Kipper was when he arrived in Calgary, so... I think so. You know, uh, goalies are very unpredictable. Like, who would have thought Victor Faust would have emerged in Anaheim as a good goalie at the age of 30? So, you know, that's like the hardest position to read even from season to season. So, you know, and, <laughs> and even that second round pick, even if we decide that we don't want to draft with it, a second round pick has quite a bit of worth on the trade market as well. So even if the Flames decide later on they need something else, that could be wrapped up with another player in a deal or traded by itself. Like, I think that a second-round pick gives you a lot of flexibility. Oh, yeah. Well, at the draft, the second-round pick could probably get you a top-six forward or a top-four defenseman. Well, look, look at all the things that so, we got for a second-round pick when Daryl Sutter was in charge here. Yeah, exactly. So... You know, it, it's good any which way. So, either they'll address a need through getting a new prospect, or they'll address a need on the pro team. So, either way, it's And right good. now, with Kerry Ramos still being on the injured reserve, the current goalie tandem is Yanni Ordeo and Joey McDonald. And if you would have asked me going into the start of the season with where everybody was, I would not have told you. I thought that's how our goalie tandem would shake down for the end of the year. What about you? Yeah, that's a little random, but, you know, Ordeo, I have to give him major props for how he played last night. He looked 
like a veteran goalie out there. You wouldn't know it was only his second game. And he was starting to actually get some swagger to him, too, on some of the saves, like some nonchalantness of, you know, like throwing out the blocker and, like, no big deal. Try harder next time type of thing. So he, That shows he's feeling comfortable. He, you know, yeah, exactly. You know, you got to give uh, Yanni Ordeo a lot of credit either way. If you look at his season, he came to Flames training camp, out of camp, he was assigned to the Alaska Aces of the ECHL. He proved his worth at the <laughs> ECHL level, got promoted to the AHL level, proved his worth at the AHL level, now he's been promoted to the NHL level, proved his worth at the NHL level, and now he's, you know, our starting goalie for at least right now until Ramo comes back at the NHL level. So, you know, that tells me for a guy to rise through the organization that quickly that at least management thinks that they've got something there. And, like, if you even go back a little further at the July development camp, like, he was by far the worst of the goalies. Like, even the walk-ons goalie was, you know, on that level. Well, that's why he would have got sent to the ECHL. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So it's good to see him bounce back and, you know, actually become an NHL player and look not looking like a bad one. And, you know, who knows? Maybe it turns out that it's a flash in the pan and nothing pans out there. But, you know, that's what we have to go through in a rebuild and find that out now as opposed to having, you know, a great team and having a goalie that can't lead us anywhere. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like that's why every year we should get a new goalie in the organization somewhere, either through the draft or otherwise, just uh, until we get somebody of Kipper's level. Just so, you know, just keep cycling them through and f- find something somewhere. Yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, if you look at goalies, they don't last on one team nearly as long as they used to, it seems. So I think a lot of teams are doing the same thing, as they're trying to flip these guys early. Yeah, well, look at how many were traded at the deadline, like 12 or 13 goalies And for got very moved. little on most of them, so, too. The return was very little. Yeah. I know, like, other than Miller, I think the Flames actually got the best return out of any of them. Yeah, on deadline day, I'd say so. And Ordeo's only 22, so even if this year he doesn't, you know, if he looks good this year, I mean, if you remember when Hanowski came up last year after the Jerome trade, he looked good, and then they sent him down to the HL and kept him there. So even if this is just a tryout almost, we have a lot of time to develop this guy. It's not like he's 27 like Barra, where it's kind of a do-or-die thing, career-wise. Yeah. Oh, exactly. And plus, having Gillies coming up the wings as well, like, it puts pressure on him to, like, try to establish himself quickly instead because there's going to be somebody right at, on the doorstep and ready Olivier to go. And Olivier was in that position right now as well. He's been playing at the ECHL level and has been, by default, promoted to the AHL. And from what I've been seeing, he's had not too bad of a time there. The other trade that the Flames made at the deadline was a player that everyone, I think, expected to move. Lee Stempniak got traded from Calgary to the Pittsburgh Penguins in exchange for a third-round draft pick this year. And this was a trade that came just, I think, just over a week after his wife had uh, their twins. So for Lee, that's probably not the best time to be traded, but it's part of the business. Yeah, well, if I recall correctly... uh... Lee's wife doesn't live in Calgary during the season, so it's not quite as bad. But, yeah, no, not a fun week. So what do you think of that deal, Stemniak for a third to Pittsburgh? Uh, that's about proper value, like especially what, in consideration of the other players that got traded. You know, like Alex Hemsky, who I would take over Stepniak easily, got only a fifth round pick more than him. So, you know. Going into deadline day, if you would have asked me, I would have valued um, Lee Stepniak at more. I would have told you the day before that I thought we'd get more for him. But you're right, as the day went on and we saw what the going value was for some of these players, I imagine the Flames had to drop their price quickly to move him. And he was one of the last deals to be done, too. Yeah. And I can't, you know, we got something for him. You know, like, ideally we would have got something closer to a second, 
or, you know, a third and a fifth or something, but it is what it is. And, you know, that deadline was one of the strangest I, it, I can remember, because, like, the prices that players got traded for was nothing. Yeah, well, and, and the Flames <laughs> so. did not do what I expected them to do. Outside of moving Camilleri, which, as we already said, we're okay with, I expected the Flames to play banker. I expected the Flames to take on some high-priced contracts in exchange for a pick for doing so. And I expected that we were going to have a bunch of old, vet, old overpaid veterans for the rest of the year, or maybe into next year. In a way, I'm glad they didn't do it, but that's kind of what I expected from Brian Burke. Yeah. Like, I was kind of expecting Danny Heatley to be a flame. So, in the, that way, I'm happy that that didn't happen. Well, he's a UFA at the end of the year, right? So, even then, it would have only been for a couple weeks. And, I mean, if you're in the position the Flames are in, you could theoretically take that contract on and scratch him. I mean, it's not like we need his help at this point. Although, that wouldn't be too good for attracting free agents in the future. True, true. Yeah, I, I'd heard Danny Heatley's name come up. Um, I'd heard some really weird deals that I knew were not going to happen. Um, I forget where I saw it. Somewhere on Twitter, somebody said that the Flames were looking at doing a straight-up deal with Toronto, and they were going to do Camilleri for Kadri, and I thought, why would Nonis trade Camilleri for Kadri straight up? Yeah. Every year there's things that are illogical in the trade rumor market. Yeah. So do you think that the Flames did enough? Uh, for the moves that they did make, they did good. You know, you wish that you could have got, say, like, moved Butler or, you know, something more than that. But, yeah, you know, at least they opened up some spots for the rookies and we get to see some kids play. So, you know, that's good. Having five picks in the top 90 this year, that's very good. I'm hoping so they far. can add another two or three. Yeah, we have five in the top 90 so far. I would be surprised if we go into the draft without having another one. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of hoping that the Flames get seven or eight picks in that range just because more darts you can throw at the board, the more like you are to hit a target. So... There's some, you know, there's some guys that I hoped would be moved um, that weren't, and knowing how trade deadlines shook down, it would have been hard to get value for them. I hoped for his own sake that uh, Shane O'Brien got moved because I don't think he's a good use of roster spot on our AHL team, and I can't imagine him being happy there. I didn't expect we'd be able to trade him one for one for something, but I expect him to be wrapped up in another deal like a, you know, Stemniak deal or a Camilleri deal or. Something like that. So obviously there's no value there. And I also expected at the end of the day to see Joey McDonald leave. Because I assumed some team would trade a goalie, have a hole, call Berkey and say, hey, you got a you got an NHL caliber goalie here. I'll give you a seventh for him. Yeah. Well, the day didn't end up panning out that way. You know, I think, you know with Shane O'Brien, that's the type of guy that typically will go at the draft for like a seventh round pick. So, you know, because some teams will want to address that spot for the, the next season. And, you know, you're more likely to see, say, like a Glenn Cross or a Hoodler or a Weidman go at the draft just because you're more likely to get proper value. Yeah. You know, because, you know, not everybody could fit in, say, Weidman's $5 million contract right now. But going into next season with the cap going up and all that, you know, getting a 40-point defenseman, you know, like... that. I, I think the team still overpay at the draft, but I think also it has to do with you're about a week, week and a half away from UFA time at that point. So there might be teams that think they can re-sign a certain guy or think that they might be able to get a certain UFA and then that guy gets signed or their player tells them they don't want to. So I think a week away from July 1st, you have a much better outlook of what your depth chart is going to look like. Yeah, and plus, if I recall correctly, teams can start negotiating on UFAs now early. Oh, yeah, that was a new CFA rule, or CBA rule, I mean. Yeah, so, like, you can kind of gauge more 
oh, well, say, like, Camilleri is not going to sign with us. They're gonna, he's going to go back to Calgary. So, you know, let's trade for Glenn Cross or Hoodler instead type of thing. So... And in the past, you had to trade for that right, because I know we traded away Jordan Leopold for the right to talk to Bowmeister. Yeah, we also traded a third with that, but yeah. Oh, was it? Okay. No, it was Leo and a third, but... Interesting. That could be good for a team like the Flames, who might want to talk to a crap ton of guys and just see who's got interest in coming here. Yeah, exactly. And... Yeah, it makes things a lot easier, so that way you're not... Like, it. how would you say it helps situations like the Hossa-Edmonton thing, where they lost Glenn Cross because they were focusing on the shiny prize? So... Yeah, and I think it might help teams, even at the draft table. I mean, if you know, okay, we've got this guy or that guy coming back, so we should bring in this type of player or that type of player. Yeah. It make more information is always good. It is. So based on what Burke did or didn't do, if you had to sign Brian Burke a letter grade for this trade deadline, uh, what would you grade him? For what he did do and like actually accomplished, A plus. For what he didn't manage to get accomplished, it's incomplete be- just on the mere fact that we don't know what Camilleri's gonna do. Um, if he signs, then the overall day is a B plus. If Camilleri doesn't sign with us, then he gets an F. I agree with you on the F if Cammy doesn't sign. I don't know that I would give Burke an A plus for his deadline performance. I think that for me, I'd probably give him an A. I think to get an A plus, he had to have moved Butler out of town as well. Because I hope they're not trying to re-sign Ditton Butler. And I think to have a... UFA that holds some value still on the team is a lost opportunity. I can't argue that there. You know, like we had O'Brien and Derek Smith available, so why not? That's it. I, yeah, I mean, we we dangled we dangled um, O'Brien earlier in the year. We've dangled Derek Smith right on. I think he cleared waivers at noon uh, Eastern time on deadline day. You know, we have Butler available. Like, there were teams that obviously had holes on defense because there were defensemen that moved who I would say were of a similar caliber of Butler or lesser. So even if it was the last trade you get in before the deadline closes, just flip them to somebody for a six. So I think there was a a lot. I don't necessarily think Cammy's a lost opportunity because we both think he's going to sign, but I hope they don't sign Butler. And if he just walks away, it's a, it's a lost opportunity. Well, the thing is, is that the Flames are going to be hard-pressed to reach the cap floor this year. And if you re-sign Butler, he's likely only going to cost a million bucks, give or take. But on the UFA market, there's likely going to be about seven really good defensemen this year, because there's about a dozen that right now, some re-sign, some don't. But there's quite a few that should be available so like if we target one of them it's likely going to cost four or five million dollars so you know like it'll make it easier to hit the floor if we get rid of butler and go that route instead i think in a rebuild especially the beginning of a rebuild like we're in you really and i know this is probably going to sound kind of heartless but you really can't give guys second chances Okay, Butler, you came in, you didn't do what we needed you to do. We can replace you with one of a number of guys, and it really doesn't matter which one that we'll find on the UFA market. So we're going to flip you, and we'll find somebody else to fill that spot in the summer who will pay a million or less or a little bit more. Like, to me, Butler hasn't done his job. It's not like we need him for a cup run, so get him out of here and give somebody else a spot. Yeah, and, you know, like, worst-case scenario is you look around, like, last year, For this year's version of Chris Russell, some underappreciated guy around the league, throw a pick at him to get him and see what you get. Instead of rehashing Butler, who's pretty much going to be what he is now, which is an eighth defenseman 
on a or good even, team. <laughs> or even just wait for UFA day and throw, you know, a million dollar contract at seven different guys and see who bites first. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I'm even looking here on the Abbotsford roster, guys that they might want to, instead of even signing a guy like a Chris Russell, guys they might want to bring up in, in that place. And, you know, Tyler Wertherspoon's looked very good this year. Patrick Selov, John Ramage, um, Chris Breen. Like, there's guys that we could bring up and fill that role. And in a rebuild, that's really what you want to do, is if you can bring up a young guy to fill the roles and do that. Yeah. And, um, like... For a seal off, I probably wouldn't go in the year. Like, I'd give him, like, half a season next year just to completely get his game back together after missing so much time. But, you know, like, there's no reason why, say, Tyler Waterspoon couldn't come up or, you know. I thought Chris Breen looked okay earlier in the year when we gave him an audition. Exactly. So... And if we look at where that position is on the depth chart, you would be a six or seven defenseman. So it's not like it needs to be a fantastic defenseman. You know, a Watherspoon, a Breen, you know, even for the rest of the year, a Derek Smith bringing him back up just to fill the hole until the summer. Like, there's a lot of guys that can... Mark Kandari, you know, I, he's kind of been banished, but that's a guy that I'd like to give a shot to and see what we've got there. Like, there's a lot of guys within the organization who we could give that role to. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm I'm kind of disappointed that he didn't find some sort of buyer for um, Butler. Yeah. Well, with uh, Weidman getting hurt last night, I think uh, Watherspoon might be on his way up, but I'm not sure. It'd be nice to get some another like a kid on the back end get some time. Yeah, it would. And, you know, now the Flames have the four emergency call-ups, so they have to be careful who they are bringing up and make sure that's the kind of the one defenseman that they want to rely on for the next four weeks or however long we yeah. have left. Actually, it's three because Hanowski oh, did right. count. Okay. So. so speaking of Hanowski, Flames have brought up a bunch of young guys on the front end. Um, we've got Marcus Granlin, Ben Hanowski, Corbin Knight all got brought up here. Um, Reinhardt, Reinhardt, and Ordeo. Um, you were at the Ottawa game. You you got to see the first of this kind of after deadline youth tryout, if you will. What did you think of the young guys? Well, I know some, a lot of Flames fans were surprised at like how steady that these guys all looked. But back in July, when I was at the development camp. Like, I saw these guys play, and, like, I was actually surprised at how good they were. And so, last night wasn't entirely a surprise to me, because, you know, they all looked NHL ready, give or take, back then. So, seeing them actually play in an actual NHL game was good to see and like Corbin Knight won 61 percent of his face-offs last night wow so you know like that's awesome <laughs> yeah how many face-offs did he take do you know 21 or 22 oh, something wow. like that okay like so he, he was won a regular a significant portion yeah yeah and you know uh Knight was probably the worst of the four forwards but like it other than in the face-off circle, but all of them looked really good. So, well, put it this way, Hanowski and Knight were playing with McGratton, and that was probably the best McGratton's ever played. <laughs> so, like he, McGratton actually got power play time in the third period because he wow. was doing such a good job offensively. Maybe he owes the rookie some dinner. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and I think the fact, too, that, I, I, you know, I mean, I've never played at this level, but I think the fact that we've had a team that's been in the Calder hunt in the AHL has meant that these guys have been playing at a high level all year. So yeah. making that jump from a winning AHL team to a losing NHL team is probably not all that much of a jump for these guys. No. And, like, you can even see, like, in their demeanor on the ice, like, each of them look like veteran NHL players. Like, Marcus Granlund, like, he's been, like, almost as composed as Michael Backlund, you know, and yet four games versus, like, four seasons. 
<laughs> you know, like yeah. And you know, it's Granlin, good to see. Granlin's a guy though who always seems to be composed. I mean, every time you see him, every time he's playing, he never seems to let a lot of stuff rattle him. No. You know, he can take big hits and just skate back to the bench and come up the next shift like nothing's happened. So I think, you know, that guy's almost like an Iceman in a lot of ways. Yeah, the kipper of forwards. <laughs> could be. Yeah, it could be. I was also happy to see that Hanowski got recalled because I know that Hanowski played for us last year when they brought him up from college after we brought him in in the Jerome trade. And he looked just kind of mediocre. You know, he didn't look like he was ready for the NHL game. He was coming out of college. So I think it's good to see that a year at the AHL level has really helped his game. Yeah. I was actually really thrilled that the three forwards that were recalled were Reinhardt, Knight, and Hanowski. The reason being is that the Flames really need to see what they have in those three guys. Yeah. With having Granlit or Gaudreau, Poirier, Klimchuk first round pick this year guy and you know other forwards coming up right behind them we need to see what these three guys have got because if Knight is just a fourth line center well we need to know that yeah you know or can he be a second line center I think these are the guys that have the most value either with this organization or or as an asset to move at the draft. And like you said, we need to know what to do with them when that decision comes. Yeah, and like each of them is like 23 and 24. So like it's pretty much time to put up or shut up. Yeah, you're, you're right at that fine line, that 23, 24, 25. Okay, do we have an NHL player here or do we not? Yeah, and on the early reviews, it appears that all three of them will be NHL players, even if it's only in a third, fourth line role. Hopefully, they have enough offense to be more than that, but, you know, they play a solid all-around game, so that's encouraging. Yeah, I, I don't think you could have asked for better college. I mean, these are the biggest name prospects out there. I'm not saying they did it for the fans, but I think these are the guys the fans want to see. And I know as a guy who follows the team, these are the prospects that I thought were the most interesting, the ones that I thought, okay, now we've got the kind of A crop of prospects. Let's see what we've got here. Yeah. Well, the A crop of the, you know, NHL-ready ones, right. at yeah. least. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but that's it. The ones that are ready to go as call-ups. Yeah. And the ones that you're exactly. okay handing, what do we have, 15 games left? The ones that you're okay handing 15 games to? Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, you know, they're also auditioning for spots next year, because if each of them impresses, then maybe you don't need to keep Westgarth or whomever, or Galliardi, or maybe even Colborne. Yeah. So, you know, it just depends. Exactly. You can you can find out what assets you're going to move, either one of these young guys or another guy. And you're right, maybe it's somebody like a Galliardi, and that's okay. We have an asset to fill that we can get an, a draft pick for Galliardi. So, you know, we, we end up winning in that respect. Yeah. And, you know, it's nice to see so many of our actual draft picks playing for us at one time. It is. I counted last <laughs> night. I think I counted seven Flames draft picks on the on this dressed roster last night. Honestly, I don't think we had that many since the 80s. No, like I remember looking at it early last year the the three of us on the show and i think we had like two guys at one point that were flames picks yeah i think it was just uh Berchi and backland yeah so you know coming from the team who for years they've said the cupboard is empty i think the flames are starting to prove that while we may not have a marquee you know tyler hall type player in our system coming up it may be monahan it may not be we have a lot of depth guys that probably will become an NHLer. so i don't think the cupboards are as bare anymore as anyone th still thinks they might be oh no like for forwards the only thing that the flames need is another star forward or two like a first line guy not necessarily a star but you know a good player and on defense we need a lot of help beyond that like the flames are deep in goal second line forwards we got plenty to spare third line forwards fourth line forwards so you know it 
our rebuild's not going to be the same as Edmonton, because at the time that Edmonton started their latest rebuild, they had no good depth forwards, and, like, they didn't really have any of anything. So I was going to say, I know. think that the bigger issue than depth forwards was they had nobody on the blue line. Yeah, like, they didn't have anything. So, you know, and, like, while they were able to address the star forwards... You know, you need good players at every relative position. And while they do have a decent first line, they don't have a good second line, they don't have a good third line, their fourth line's atrocious, and you wonder why they're behind us. Yeah. So, you know, at least the Flames seem to have, like, the second, third, and fourth lines being decent. It's just we need to get a good first line going. To me, the ideal situation this year is that we end up above Edmonton in the standings and beat Edmonton in the lottery. Yeah. That would be perfect. You know, get Reinhardt in here and, you know, go to town. Yeah, exactly. The other Reinhardt. Yeah. So, anything else you want to chat about this week, Matt? Uh, I'm good. I think this is the big Flames news since the Olympics. These are the This is the time that we've been waiting for is trade deadline and... You know, I think we're both very happy, maybe not completely happy, but we're very happy with what's gone on so far. Yeah, we got 15 games or something now to try these guys out to see how they're doing and to go from there and say, okay, what have we got? And as Flames fans, it lets us see what the next generation of this team is going to be. Yeah, and it looks like a bunch of hardworking, lunch pail guys, so, you know... Which is good. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the Islanders game because I think it's going to be a good game with these guys in the lineup. Mm. Same here. And I hope Bordio has another repeat performance because I'd like to see him establish himself as the starter. I agree. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I want to make it very difficult when Ramo comes back for him to get that job. You know, I want it to be lost, essentially, and have him really fight tooth and nail for it, which I think he did with... Red Obara for a while there. Yeah. And that made exactly. him better. Competition is always good. Well, Matt, let's, uh, let's move on to our feature for this week. And we actually, a couple weeks ago, we talked to Flames uh, veteran Rico Fata. And this week, we're actually talking to another Flames veteran. We're talking to Kale Hulse. Do you remember Kale Hulse? He was here during the Young Guns era and then came back in 2005. Oh, very much so. Decent depth defenseman. Kale's a Calgary boy who now lives in Phoenix and works in the financial services industry. We got the chance to sit down with him and reminisce about his time as a flame, his career in the NHL, and here's that interview. This is Dan Stevenson with Fireside Chat, and I'm here with Kale Halls. How are you doing today, Kale? I'm doing good, Dan. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for a uh, Old Flames interview. Well, thanks for thinking of me. Um, it's an honor to be remembered um, for my playing days in Calgary that you know were obviously very special. It's, it's when I broke into the NHL, and to do so at home in front of um, all my friends and family, it was a very special time for me. You were born in Edmonton, but you grew up in Calgary most of your childhood, right? Right. I think I always joke, uh, if there was one thing I could have changed on, on my stats, it would be um, hometown of Calgary. You know, they go always put where you were born, and and I don't think I lived in Edmonton more than a couple of months, so I consider myself a Calgary boy. Okay, cool. And as you're speaking of being a Calgary boy, one of our fans, uh, he goes by the name Flames Win, wants to know your thoughts um, at EP Scarlet High School, did you know that you're on the Wall of Fame there and another famous EP Scarlet grad, Danny Heatley, is not? Well, first of all, I'm honored to be on any uh, Wall of Fame. Um, you know, I I enjoyed growing up in Calgary. Um, I en- it's a great place to grow up. It is. It, it was awesome. And, you know, I enjoyed very much going to Scarlet. I had a great group of friends enjoyed high school there and you know i i haven't seen the photo i haven't been back to my high school since probably my 10-year reunion but um it's very cool anytime you can be recognized as um you know for doing something special i i find that a huge honor and um you know maybe in hopes it gives 
some other young hockey players in Calgary going to Scarlet, you know, and they see that, that they realize that maybe they can, they can accomplish some of their goals and dreams. Yeah, they can do it too, right? Absolutely. So speaking about, uh, you know, being a Calgary boy and all that, you were drafted by the New Jersey Devils and traded to the Flames um, in a, quite a big deal um, in 1996. Tell us what the emotion was when you got called to the GM's office in uh, New Jersey and were pretty much told that you're going home. Well, it was, um, it was mixed emotions, really. You know, I, um, I had played most of my time in the minors with the Albany River Rats, and we had a, a great coach, great team. We won a championship the same year the Devils won the Stanley Cup. So it goes to show you the amount of talent that was in that organization at the time. Um, I was maybe an old, from the old school mindset of wanting to and had envisioned me being a devil my whole career, but also realizing the depth in the organization at that time that being traded and being traded to my hometown was, was a dream come true. You know, I was a kid that lived and died for the flames growing up and, you know, always bitter at when they would lose to the Oilers. So coming home and, and really getting to solidify my NHL career and, and, and really start my career at home was, was a dream come true. And, you know, as much as, like you said, it's bittersweet, it's got to be good to know that there's another team out there that wanted you and wanted you bad enough to give up assets to get you. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, it feels good to be wanted and, and appreciated for, for your skill set um, enough to where they make a move. And, you know, it, it made that transition a little easier. I know there was, there was definitely some nerves. I don't think I played a hockey game in Calgary since I was 17 years old. So to come back and do it at that level um, was very exciting. Now you got traded to the Flames along with Tommy Elbelin and Jocelyn the Mew. When you get traded with a group of guys like that, is there an instant camaraderie with these guys of, you know, you're all the new guys in town trying to look after each other and that sort of thing? It definitely helps, Um, especially for me being so early in my career. Um, Tommy and I got along well. We knew each other better than I knew Jocelyn. And being a defenseman, um, Tommy being a defenseman helped me even more. He was a great mentor for me and um, really took me under his wing. And it definitely made it um, made me more comfortable because he was in the same same scenario as me. I don't think he had been been traded before. So we were both coming to a new team with a new opportunity. And, and I think we, we, he probably helped me out more, but I tried to help him out as much as I could too. Well, that's what a team's for, right? Everyone's got to help each other out. Well, absolutely. And, um, you know, the more you bond sometimes off the ice and, and um, find things in common, I think that that um, naturally helps on the ice and in the locker room. Are you still a Flames fan? Do you still watch many games? I do. You know, I, um, I'm down in Scottsdale, Arizona. I've been down here for almost 11 years, but um, you know, I was always active. I'd always come home and play in the Flames alumni. It's been a few years since I've been up there, but you know, I, it's been ingrained in me as a kid. Again, growing up and, and rooting for the Flames, that was my team. You know, and I always wanted to see them do well. And you know, I don't think there's anyone left on the team that I played with. You know, I think Iggy was the last guy. So I, I do watch them. I always look for them in the standings to see how they're doing. There's there's more natural. There's a more natural connection with me, not so much rooting for teams anymore, but more rooting for the guys I played with. You know, I'd love to see Jerome go on and win a Stanley Cup. A guy like that, that's such a, such a great person on top of being a phenomenal hockey player. I really would like to see him do well. Yeah, and you know, I know you said you'd have him come back here in a couple of years to play in the alumni game, but that's the feeling around Calgary too. Is we all love Jerome. We all appreciate what he did here. We're in the Flaming Sea, and we want to see him do well too. Yeah, I mean, how can you not? Exactly. You know, there's there's really only a handful of guys that I had the honor of playing with that were were as good as him in a hockey sense. But really, what I think makes that even more special is that he's such a such a great person. Yeah, I mean, I've ne- I've never met him, but I've heard that, and everyone that ever interacts with Jerome or has played with Jerome has nothing but good things to say. So that's a that's the kind of guy that you want to do well in anything they do. Absolutely. So, Kale, as a young defenseman who really came onto a Flames team that I guess we could say is probably when you came to the team in the same sense they are right now, they were in, in a rebuild. Um, they had a lot of young players on that team, and you got to jump right in there. What advice would you have for a young defenseman trying to jump into the same kind of role now like TJ Brody? Well, you know, it's 
being a young defenseman, it's, it's maybe aside from being a goaltender, it's probably one of the hardest positions to, to break into the league. And, um, doing so on a younger team, on an inexperienced team, it's kind of twofold. First, it's a tremendous opportunity that you have to make the most of, but it, um, being a, a young guy and a young team, it also makes that a little more difficult because the wins don't come as, as easily as you would hope. Um, you know, there's, I think for us that one year we were dubbed the young guys. I think there might've been eight to 10 rookies on that team. So a lot of inexperience, but again, you, you know, you can, you can go through those hard times with a, with the other rookies knowing that, you know, you've, you've got each other's backs and, you know, you've got to do everything you can to improve, to, to solidify your spot in the lineup. And it's, and it's definitely, it's a learning curve. And it's a thing where you've got to be patient. You know, most guys getting into the NHL have been very successful. But when you get into that, the top league in the world, um, it's a big step. And again, being a defenseman, it takes time to mature, to really understand the game, to learn what it takes to be a pro night in and night out. And, to learn how to practice like a pro and, and all those little things ultimately are what make, makes the big difference as you mature as a player. You know, I, back to my Jersey days, I was very lucky to have um, guys like Scott Stevens, Tommy Abilene, um, Scott Niedermeyer, Bruce Driver, Ken Danico. These guys were all seasoned pros. So, you know, you find yourself watching everything they do on the ice, off the ice, practice, how they play, how they handle themselves. And the young flame defensemen can do that from the veteran guys. You know, that's, that again is a big part of the learning curve because, you know, the hockey, the games, the success may not come as, as quickly as you'd like, but, you know, everyone's human and you're going to have good games, bad games. It's how you rebound and how you, how you react to maybe a bad play or, or a bad game that is going to show management, show your teammates that you're, you're capable to recover and you're capable to become a solid pro. That mental conditioning that goes along with it. It's huge. You know, I think it's often overlooked people that, um, that aren't in that position, you know, you're only judged with your performance on the ice, but a lot goes into it. Um, you know, you, you get, you earn the trust of your coaching staff and of your teammates. And then, you know, one or two bad bounces or a bad play can really, really rattle you and test you as a young, as a young man and as a young pro. Yeah, I bet. And, you know, most of our audiences, well, I doubt any of our audiences ever played at that high level hockey. And yeah, I think you're right. That's probably the thing a lot of people don't understand is more than just the skill on the ice, the mental conditioning that goes into the game. Well, it's huge. You know, you, you learn to develop um, thick skin and, and the stronger you are mentally, I think the sooner you may find success because it's, it's a business bottom line. And, and it's a tough business in the sense that it's, it's all driven around a simple fact of wins and losses. And if you're not winning, people don't care about your emotional state or your mental state. They want to see wins. Exactly. They want to see you in the playoffs. So as a player, you know, you have to find a way to perform every night at your best because, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough, tough business and a tough world. And, you know, people don't really care if, if you've been rattled mentally or emotionally, you've just got to, be ready to perform the next night. Yeah, they're paying a lot of money to see you put out a top performance every night. Absolutely. So, Kale, you've had a unique opportunity with the Flames. You played here, like you said, during the Young Guns era, as it's been called, during the mid to late 90s. And then you got the chance to come back for a little bit in 2005, 2006. You really were here during a time when this team was close to irre irrelevant in the NHL and in people's minds here, I think, in the 90s. And then when it was the hottest ticket in town in 2005, 2006, what was it like to be part of the team during those two eras? Did you feel the buzz around the arena, around just the team to be very different in those two periods? Oh, without a doubt. Um, you know, my first my first experience with the team again we were young and, and we were inconsistent and inexperienced and um you know people understood that as 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 a fan base but it you know it also showed we didn't have great attendance and i don't blame the fans they were probably getting a little impatient but it's it's a huge difference in comparison to when i came back um right from when i first walked in the locker room when i came back um it was a different attitude and a different mindset. And Daryl Sutter, I think, did a fantastic job 
putting that in place. You know, the guys had a great run a few years prior, uh, making it to the Stanley Cup Finals, and there was that winning attitude that was ingrained in every player on the team, and and it showed throughout. I mean, throughout the whole city, you know, there was a huge buzz about the team, and and the expectations were much higher. And that's, you know, that's that's something that you appreciate as a player, but you also understand how much work goes into getting to that level. I imagine even in the back, you know, in the backstage area, if you will, around the dressing room and that sort of thing, more reporters, um, just more, I guess you probably felt more like it was game on when you came back the second time that this team was ready and you had to be on your game right from the beginning. Well, yeah, again, it was, it was just the expectations and not, not only from a fan standpoint or a media standpoint, it was, it was from within and, and all the players, you know, we expected to win. Daryl expected the best out of us every night. And that, that's really how it grows. You know, you need to have success. You need to learn from, from your mistakes and from prior experience, but you know, they, they were a different team and that different mindset um, was, was, was the big difference. You know, again, when you go into a game and when you go into the rink, not hoping you win or hoping you keep it close, but expecting to win and expecting to be in the playoffs is huge. Well, that's great to hear. I've always been a big fan of Daryl Sutter's, and I know that recently he's got a lot of criticism around town, but he's a good hockey guy. Like him or hate him, he knows how to motivate a team, and he's a good hockey guy. Well, his record speaks for itself. Exactly. I mean, you know, he went into L.A. I think they were eighth or ninth, you know, fighting for a playoff spot, and I knew, I, I told the hockey people down here that you got to watch the Kings because he's going to, he's going to bring that work ethic. He's going to get the best he can out of all his players. And, and he did that and he was rewarded with, with the ultimate goal. And that's the Stanley cup. As a Daryl Sutter fan, I'm glad to hear that from a guy who played for Daryl. So Kale, as a, as a guy who's played here for a number of years and then got traded away to the Nashville predators, um, what was it like coming back to the dome not wearing the flaming sea. I imagine that had to be an emotional time to be, you know, at the arena that you grew up idolizing, that you played for for so many years. Now being on the other side of the coin, you know, it was always, um, it was always tough coming back to Calgary. I mean, I loved coming back, obviously, and seeing friends and family and getting a chance to play. But there was always mixed emotions, you know. Maybe just because I had played there for so long and I grew up there and watched and loved Flames as a kid. Um, you know, you always wanted to play your best. You always wanted to beat them. Um, but I always felt very tied to the Flames on a deep level because of growing up as a kid in Calgary. I bet. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the Flames are really the last NHL team that you played for. Yeah, I played my last game in the NHL as a Calgary Flame. So that's kind of cool. I know you had a tryout with uh, you had a tryout after that and didn't make it past camp. But that's really cool that you got to play your last game as a Flame. It is, you know. And, like I, as a as a kid growing up, like every other kid in Calgary playing hockey, I played the game because I loved it and I had a lot of fun doing it. I was never, by any stretch, the most skilled guy. I was, you know, I refer to myself as a square piece to the puzzle. I just, I worked as hard as I could. I took pride in what I did, and the further along I went, um, you know, and and playing it at different top levels, I realized that, you know, I may have a chance of playing. And, and again, getting to do so at home was, was a dream come true. I can only imagine. What's your favorite memory of your time as a flame? Um, there's a few, a few times, uh, obviously my first goal and it was at home against Vancouver. I mean, every kid dreams of scoring a goal in the NHL and, you know, being able to do that as a flame at home was, was pretty special. Um, being a teammate of Theo Fleury, you know, meant a lot to me because he was an idol of mine growing up. And I think, I think it was the night he either broke the points record or the assist record. Um, I can't remember who held it previously. Maybe Al McInnes. Um, at that time, that was that was pretty cool. I always wanted to see Theo do well and to be a teammate. I think I think it was maybe a goal that that put him over that mark. And I may have had an assist on it. So that to me was a special time. That would have been for sure. Um, one of the things our fans love to hear, kind of going back with Flames memories as well, is one of your favorite road stories or one of the best jokes that you've played on a teammate over the years on the road. Anything you want to share with us? Um, 
the, the practical jokes were nonstop. You know, again, having a group of so many young guys, we had a lot of fun. And, you know, it was a little different than travel-wise where a lot of our trips early on were we flew commercial. So that in itself was always always a good time and good opportunities to play jokes. But I, one of my great memories was uh, our rookie meal, and it happened to be down here in, in Phoenix. And it was a good thing that we had so many rookies because – you know, I think that's still a long-standing tradition. The, the team goes out for dinner, and then the rookies end up paying for it. So I think we split it ten ways. But that was that was a good feeling where, you know, as a player, you felt that you've made it. You know, and and I just remember share, being able to share that with so many other rookies, and that memory always stands out for me. I mean, no matter you know if you think you're the best NHL player or not, the fact is you're still being paid to play hockey at the highest level, and you know only so many guys in their career can say they've done that. So yeah, you you have made it if you're at that position. Well, absolutely, and you know, and I, it's hard to put into perspective for people, but you know, I I often tell people if you think about every person in the world that's playing hockey, I mean, the numbers would be would be astounding, and then you look at how many get to put on an NHL jersey and compete at that level. I don't know if there's 700 or 750 players in the NHL, but to get into that group um, takes a special person, you know, with, with special talent. Yeah, so, you know, and that's something you'll always be remembered for, and nobody can take that away from you. Oh, without a doubt. Of all the cities that you played for, um, was Calgary your favorite to play in because it was home? It was, you know, I was, I was very fortunate. Um, you know, I get asked that question a lot and I look back at my career and I enjoyed every stop along the way. You know, I was, I was lucky to play with, with great guys. You know, I wasn't always playing on the best team, but a great group of guys, great cities. You know, I enjoyed Nashville. I love playing here in Phoenix. Um, and I was lucky too, in the sense where I got to play in Canada with with the big pressure of the media and everything and it being my hometown but then the other end of the spectrum it was nice to towards the end of my career come to phoenix and play where it's very different in that sense you're not always getting the media attention um you know after a bad game or a bad practice it was easy to escape mentally because it's 75 80 degrees and there's palm trees and you can go for a swim and do different things so getting to experience all of that and everything in between was was pretty cool yeah i I guess it would be a very different atmosphere playing in calgary and then going and playing in phoenix or even probably columbus same idea you you can kind of escape once the game is done you can um and nashville was the same you know nashville i think my first year was, was only the team's third year in the league so and being down in tennessee you know not a lot of people knowing much about the game but but having that support and having great passionate fans that was also an awesome place to be so kale are you officially retired from hockey do you ever get the itch to lace on this lace up the skates and go play again well i'm yeah i've officially been retired now for eight years so um it can be a difficult transition and being out of it now for this is my eighth season I'm able to look back and see that I went through a cycle where I really had that itch and it was really foreign to me not to be playing the first year. Um, but having the time and, and having our family and having our kids, you realize there's, there's more to life. It's a great experience. It's something that no one will ever be able to take away from me. Um, and as far as the itch and getting to play, um, that desires, those needs are met by me being active with the Coyote alumni where we get to play once or twice a month during the season and we just help raise charity, raise money for charity for local hockey programs here in town. There you go. So you still, you still strap on the skates from time to time. I do, and it's, it's fun for me. It's fun to be with a good group of guys here we have in the alumni, and it's great for my kids who never got to see me play so in their eyes, that is the NHL. So they enjoy it. You know, and as a matter of fact, we have a game tonight. So it's always a good time for me to get out there and play and for, for my kids to see me play. That's awesome. And then since uh, retirement, you've sort of transitioned out of the hockey world, and you now work for the Nelson Financial Group down there in Scottsdale. What do you do for the Nelson Financial Group? Well, we're a, uh, a small firm. We're, we're actually uh, we're close to home and it's the transition's been great. I work with a great group of guys. Um, 
you know, the, the hardest part really being done was not knowing what direction to go. And, and obviously I think it's natural for most guys, you know, that are done, all they really know is hockey. So, you know, I went through that phase of not being sure if I wanted to get into coaching or stay in the game. But I also, you know, I was okay without being in the game. You know, I loved hockey, but I didn't live for it. So I just, I took some time. And again, I, I feel I'm very fortunate to, to be doing something that where I can leverage what I did for all those years. And, you know, I really, what drives me is to help, help players, younger players or veteran players avoid making mistakes that I've seen guys make with their money. You know, it's, it's a great way to make a living, but what guys may not realize at the time when they're playing is that it's, it's pretty short lived and you really never know when the end of your career is going to come. So if I can help guys secure their financial future, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy to be in that position. I imagine some of these guys that are, you know, 18, 19 year old and making multi-million dollars for the first time too, aren't probably the best savers. It's let's buy this toy or that toy. And before you know it, it's probably easy to blow that. Well, absolutely. Um, you know, again, I always joke that my last job, I drove a forklift at Leon's. So whatever that paid me an hour into suddenly starting to make real money, um, you know, it's, it's thrown at you and you're, you're living in a bubble. You know, you're, you're playing at the top level, you're living your dream, you're making a lot of money, but it's not, it's not reality. You know, now I've been out of it for eight years. I know how hard it is to make a living and really to, again, to, to help the younger guys, you know, to reiterate to them that, you know, you're making good money, enjoy it, but save, you know, it, it's important to have a plan in place. And the earlier you do it, the better off you're going to be down the road. Well, that's great. It's great that you can do that and you can work with those guys to do that. Yeah, it is. Um, and again, I think what strengthens um, my story and my position is that I've been out of the game for eight years. So, you know, I'm, I'm in the real world and I'm, and I'm out there working like everyone else. And, you know, you, you playing in the NHL, you definitely, you get a great head start. And, you know, hopefully the young guys, they, they go on to play long careers and make, make a lot of money. But, the planning and the preparation that goes on behind the scenes is crucial. Well, even those guys, I mean, even if you were to have the longest career, I mean, you look at someone like Chelios, you know, you're out by, you're still out by the time you're in your mid to late, you know, mid forties to late forties. So still a lot of life that you're going to need to plan for. Well, there's no question, you know, and a guy like Chelios would be the extreme, you know, most guys, their oh, careers sure. probably end in their 32, 30. 33. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I was 32 and you know, you're, you're still a very young man at that point. So there's a lot of life to live and, you know, if you've got kids and everything else, there's a huge shift in focus. So having that nest egg and having things taken care of properly can really help you get a huge head start in life. Awesome. And Kayla, you're pretty active on Twitter as well. If uh, fans want to get a hold of you or share some of their memories with you as a flame, best way to do that is to follow you at Kale Hulse 32. Yes, that's it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm on there every once in a while. I was, I was lucky um, for people that may not follow golf. I, we just had the TPC, the Phoenix Open down here uh, a couple weeks ago, and I went out and played that yesterday, and it was pretty cool. They still have a lot of the bleachers up, so I took a picture and on the 16th hole that they, they turned into basically a stadium around the whole golf course. So I took a picture cool. of that, and it's pretty cool for people to check out. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. So, yeah, I know a lot of our fans uh, wanted to know what's up with you so they can follow you on Twitter and hear even more. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I always – I'm always taking pictures and things. And if um, – you know, I, I kind of use it as a way to joke, too. I know you guys have had a long, cold winter. And um, even that brutal. picture of me on the golf course yesterday, uh, people might like to see that. But even different Coyote alumni things and, you know, and different former teammates and I get together, I always usually put something on there and post it. So you can check me out on Twitter and, and see what we're up to down here in the desert. Anything else you want to share with our listeners, Kale? Um, no, again, just I'm, I'm thankful people, you know, are, are interested in, in what I'm doing. You know, I, I'll never forget those days of, of going to the rink every day and playing in the Saddle Dome and, you know, it, and being able to live my dream. You know, there's, there's so many kids that grow up playing hockey in Canada and to let them realize that, you know, it can be done. Um, it was, it was really cool. 
I went back to one of my old schools as a flame and sat in a fourth grade class and it was my same teacher that I had. So wow. to be able to reach out and, and touch kids and really hopefully impact them in a positive way for them to realize that, you know, anything can happen. And, you know, I, I find that uh, the quarterback of the Seattle Seahawks, he had a great quote. His father would always ask him, why not you? You know, and really what's stopping anyone, you know, have fun, work hard and, and, you know, one day you can make it. So if, if I inspire one kid to work a little harder and hopefully make it, you know, I think that's pretty cool. That would be cool. Well, thanks for joining us today, Kale. It's been great catching up with you. Well, yeah, again, thanks for having me. I, I enjoyed um, getting to share some of the stories, and um, i got to get back home. Maybe I'll do so sometime in the spring when all that snow is gone. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> definitely stay away until the snow is gone. It's been crazy this <laughs> yeah. winter. Yeah, absolutely. You've probably seen some bad Calgary winters, but this is the worst one I can remember. Yeah, that's what I've heard. So, again, I'm I'm in no rush to get up there till it warms up a little bit. Come by in the summer. <laughs> yeah, of course. All right, well, thanks a lot, Kale. Thank you. Appreciate it. And... That's it for another episode. As usual, we ask that you follow us online. On Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat. You can also download the show or subscribe to us weekly to get shows automatically through iTunes or Stitcher. We're on Google+. And we have a new YouTube channel where we're also going to be posting the shows in sort of a video format. So we hope you'll follow us in one of those venues, and we'll see you next week. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.